Okay, good evening everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation this evening. Um, welcome to the My Horse University and the Extension Horse Quest's live webcast titled Colic, Diagnosis, Treatment, and Prevention. This webcast kicks off a horse health series which will include four more webcasts on important health topics in the coming months. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Elizabeth Carr, Associate Professor at Michigan State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. A New York native, Dr. Carr earned her bachelor's degree from Cornell University in 1982 and her DVM from Tufts University in 1989. She then changed coasts and completed an internship at Washington State University and a residency in equine internal medicine at the University of California, Davis. She remained at Davis until 1999, completing a PhD in molecular oncology and working as an internist in the equine medicine department. Dr. Carr then joined the equine medicine department at Michigan State University in 1999, where she's been here ever since. She focuses on her um, clinical interests in, in the critical care and neonatal medicine. Her research interest includes critical care medicine, specifically in the area of improving care. Please note that you will be able to ask questions via the text chat toward the left of your screen during the presentation, and the questions will be facilitated by Santiago Garcia, who is currently a resident with the Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine. The presentation today will be recorded and uploaded to our website this week if you want to review it at a later date. And at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Carr. Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to my very first seminar or webinar, I guess. So hopefully this will um, go well. I've never really given a talk to um, my computer and my cat, so hopefully um, this will be uh, um, not too difficult. So today we're going to talk about equine colic, and what I hope to do today um, is to give you some information to prepare you with um, some uh, advice as to how what would be considered normal in your horse and when to what are the clinical signs of colic as well as some of the risk factors that um, we know are associated with colic and ways that you may might you may be able to minimize those risks. So to begin with, sorry I have to learn how to turn the slides. Oh. There I am. Um, colic is uh, essentially a term that for the vast majority of us we think of colic as being gastrointestinal pain, um, but colic is really can be manifested as any kind of pain, although most commonly in the horse it's, it is a sign of abdominal pain. But even with abdominal pain we will sometimes have horses present with uh, kidney disease or let's say a, a bladder stone or liver disease, um, as well as others, uh, musculoskeletal, laminitis, um, tying up, those types of things and then reproductive um, diseases so colic although most people think of it as gastrointestinal can just refer to a horse that is un uncomfortable and not feeling well how do you tell if your horse has colic well to begin with one of the one of the most important things you can do to get, um, help yourself is to know what is normal and so so that when you are worried about your animal you can get out a thermometer and a stethoscope and and um, get some vital parameters and decide if you really do indeed have a horse that is showing signs of colic. Um, normal temperature for a horse um, varies from about 99 to 101 1.5, um, and that's Fahrenheit. Heart rate of an adult horse should be between about 30 and 44, 45 beats per minute. And the best way to assess or listen to a heart is to either stick a stethoscope under the left elbow, or if you don't have a stethoscope, sometimes you can even place the palm of your hand under the left elbow and um, feel the pulse and get a heart rate. The alternative spot is to palpate the pulse um, under the mandible, or which is the bottom of the jaw. If you run your finger along the bottom of the mandible, you can feel um, about a pencil sized vessel, which is an artery, and if you apply gentle pressure to that artery, you can count the pulse, which is equal to the heart rate. The respiratory rate of a horse should be about 12 to 36 beats per minute, or breaths per minute, and um, it is a lot harder to listen with a stethoscope and hear breath sounds, so one of the simplest ways to get count a respiratory rate is to watch the nostrils. So get your watch out and then count the times the nostrils flare and use that to measure. In addition to these, your TPR, it is a good idea to get um, to have a stethoscope so that you can auscult intestinal sounds. Or if, again, in a pinch, you can just try to listen at your horse's flank to get an assessment of whether or not you hear any sounds at all or are they completely absent. 
Colic signs can vary a great deal. Mild colic signs are often, um, will, the horse will show evidence of maybe kicking at its belly, laying down, looking at it, their side, curling their lip, which is called the Flemin response. Um, they may just simply just not act right. They may be playing in their water, not drinking, uh, grinding their teeth, um, refusing to eat, or just turning their head and um, putting their head in a corner when they normally would be at the front of the stall when you walk up. Normal mucous membranes in a horse are also a really important thing to assess when you're about to call your veterinarian. So this slide, uh, let me get my pointer. This picture um, right here is a horse with relatively normal mucous membranes. You can see they're relatively pink and that varies. Some will be lighter, some will be darker, as opposed to this horse whose membranes are very dark pink and bright sort of reddish pink. Um, and then the third horse is showing you a sign of a horse that has is a, is a little bit dehydrated. So when somebody pressed on the gum line, you can see they left a thumbprint here. And that thumbprint lasted long enough that the veterinarian could actually take a picture. So looking at the color and then assessing by blanching it how long it takes to refill um, is very helpful information for your vet. And an, a normal gum should be pink and moist, so it should feel moist when you touch it, and should have a refill. So when you blanch it, it should refill fill usually around two to two and a half seconds. More severe signs of colic and certainly um, signs that are uh, much more distressing and worrisome are when a horse gets down and is rolling um, or shows evidence as shavings on his back um, and uh, is you know with evidence of dirt etc. Breathing hard, um, sweating, severe sweating and abdominal distension are all um, often con are considered more severe signs of colic. So if you think your horse has colic, the probably the next step to figuring out whether or not you, you need to take action is, is simply call your vet and give them the, um, describe what's going on and get their input as to whether or not this is a colicky horse. Before you do that though, there's a lo several things that you should write down before you call to give him, he or she, the most information to decide whether or not this is a situation that they should come out and assess themselves. So while it doesn't probably may um, seem to be important information, the breed and the age and the gender of your horse can be useful in determining whether or not this is a serious disease. Certainly older horses and actually some breeds of horses are predisposed to certain types of colic. Um, in addition, the type of colic signs and the duration of colic signs is very important as well as the severity of them and um, this can also, providing the temperature, pulse, and respiration will be very useful for the veterinarian to assess a degree of pain. In addition, um, determining the last time your horse passed manure, um, whether or not the horse has been eating and drinking normally, and whether or not the horse has received any medications um, prior to or in the last few weeks prior to um, the episode of colic. Some of the predisposing factors that we um, clearly recognize that predispose for colic include obviously showing or travel. So anytime um, something changes in the horse's life, it always makes them a little bit more susceptible to colic simply because it may throw off their normal routine. Um, we know that miniature horses are more prone to colic, particularly um, foals, because of their predilection to eat abnormal feedstuffs like shavings and um, wood, etc. Um, high grain diets are associated with increased risk of colic, and certainly changing diets rapidly can, or switching over to a different grain, etc., can increase the risk of colic. Change in weather, um, while it may not initially make sense, and quite honestly, there's we're not exactly sure what the risk factors, but certainly when the weather changes, particularly goes gets very cold or gets very hot, we often see an increased risk of colic. And most commonly, we think that that's at least partially associated with the fact that horses may change their water intake. Water, to uh, predisposing factors for colic, um, water availability and consumption, of course, um, if the water is not palatable, um, the horse will be less likely to drink adequate amounts. Um, in addition, keeping it warmer in the winter. Um, some horses do not like to drink cold water, particularly if they're older horses with sensitive teeth, will um, be important and very occasionally, but um, a few years ago we did have an outbreak of colic at one barn and um, the assessment of the situation, we realized that there had been a short in the electrical fencing and the horses when they tried to drink out of the automatic waterers were getting shocked. And so sometimes looking in to make sure that, you know, the situation is normal, that there aren't any problems that aren't obvious when you first evaluate them. 
parasites are a big problem for colic, but primarily in, in youngsters um, because youngsters don't have the immunity that older horses do. So whereas an adult horse that's exposed to ascarid eggs on the, on the pasture um, is, is able to clear them and not develop a severe ascarid infection, um, infestation, a young horse will quickly develop one, and um, which can lead to colic. And uh, particularly at times, if they're dewormed with something that kills off the, a large volume of adult parasites, they can get an impaction. And the picture in the on the right here is a fairly graphic picture of um, ascarid impaction of the small intestine in a young horse. So um, ascarids, particularly in young horses, are, are, can be a significant problem. In addition, small strongyles, which are uh, usually called cyathostomes, um, can be a problem of all ages and are the one parasite where we are seeing the greatest amount of resistance to, to our routine dewormers or anthelmintics. So um, knowing your parasite, having adequate parasite control, et cetera, can be very important in trying to minimize colic. Michigan, I didn't realize when I moved here that Michigan was basically um, a sandbar. I was kind of shocked coming from, most recently from California, that there was actually sand in the soil of Michigan, and, but there is in a large amount. And so we had lots of sand colic in California, and we continue to have lots of sand colic in Michigan. Um, much of Michigan has sand in its soil. If I walk out of my backyard and pick up a handful, it's full of sand. And um, so any horse that's on a sandy pasture or fed off of the ground is at risk for developing a sand colic. The picture in the top of the screen, um, sorry, I'm trying to get my little thing to work. It's not seeming to want to work. Uh, the picture on the upper right is actually an x-ray taken of a horse with sand colic and shows um, sand inside the um, abdomen of the horse. So this is actually outlining the large colon. I, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I think you're supposed to be able to since I can't get the pointer right now to work. Um, but this very white material in that x-ray is actually sand that settled out into the large colon. And as you can imas imagine, just like on the beach, as it settles out and fills up and fills up, it can ultimately obstruct that large colon and cause an impaction. Poor dental health is certainly a predisposing factor. Um, every year we get um, older horses that come in with impactions because they're unable to masticate or chew their food adequately. When a horse has a severe abnormality to their mouth, like this horse in uh, the right-hand picture, um, they're not going to be able to grind their, their food effectively. And the surface here is very irregular, and it's supposed to be in a horse's mouth. But if they have these severe points, like you can see in the rostral or front portion of this, this um, set of teeth, uh, you can imagine that this horse is not going to be able to have that nice rotary movement that they use to grind their feed. And so they're going to swallow feed that is much longer fiber and have a much greater risk that, risk that that fiber will impact them down the road. The use of drugs, and it doesn't have to just be non-steroidals, but that's certainly one of the more common um, drugs that we see problems with, can also predispose for colic. So um, non-steroidals like banamine or bute are the common terms for these drugs, um, can predispose horses to colic because of the increased risk of causing both stomach ulcers or gastric ulcers or colonic ulcers, which occur in the hind gut of the horse. Um, and these can result in recurrent and sometimes quite severe pain in a horse when they're um, used um, either excessively or in some situations, unfortunately, even when they're used appropriately, horses can develop ulcers of either the stomach or the colon. Other factors that we know are uh, play a risk for um, colic, foreign bodies. We had a horse in just this winter that um, ate its buddy's blanket. Of course, it was a young horse, a yearling. They're much more pre prone to doing that and um, ingested a fairly long piece of the blanket, which subsequently obstructed its distal intestine, requiring surgery. Every year we had a horse that does something like that, whether it be twine or a blanket, was quite impressive. Um, in addition, things like uh, mares that have recently foaled are at much greater risk for developing what's called a large colon impact or torsion, which is a surgical lesion. Older horses um, have a greater risk of developing fatty tumors in their abdomen, and these fatty tumors can actually 
hang off of the, the intestine somewhat like a tether ball and wrap around the intestine and strangulate it or cut off the blood supply requiring surgery to fix it. Um, in addition, uterine torsions are associated with an increased risk of colic as well. So how do we prevent colic? Well, unfortunately, the best management in the world can't guarantee that you won't ever have a colic, but there are things you can do to try to minimize the risks. And I know from looking at some of the web comments this morning that many of you have already recognized that um, changes are probably one of the biggest things. So making feed changes slowly is very important. Um, if you do decide to switch over to a new feed or add something to your horse's diet, whether it be to try to get the animal to gain weight or to try to give them some particular source of energy or vitamins, etc., you need to do it carefully and slowly. So um, when you add a new grain, um, start out by mixing it small amounts with the old grain and then slowly transfer them over to it. When you turn a horse onto pasture, make sure you do it slowly, particularly in the spring when the pastures have the highest sugar content and are at the greatest risk for not only causing colic but potentially laminitis. We know that sweet feeds, or what are also referred to as concentrate feeds, can predispose to colic symptoms um, and should never be fed in a larger than two or three pounds at any one feeding. If you feed more than two to three pounds, actually much of that sweet feed grain will not be digested in the small intestine and will actually make it to the large colon, um, being fermented there and causing gas and potentially problems associated with colic. Um, in addition, sweet feeds don't buffer the intest the stomach nearly as well as hay feeding does. And so when you feed sweet feeds or concentrates, the pH in the stomach drops more severely than it does with hay, resulting in an acid environment and making the likelihood of ulcers, stomach ulcers, worse. If you are going to feed sweet feed, it's probably best to feed it after you've fed some hay so that you have a nice thick hay mat that's buffering the stomach. And certainly it's also probably best if you are going to feed sweet feeds that you don't feed them before you ride. Um, probably the best thing to feed before you get on your horse, particularly if you're going to have a heavy work, is again some hay so they have a nice hay mat in their stomach to kind of buffer for their, act for their job. I just want to mention that there is a difference between sweet feeds or concentrates and what are called complete pelleted feeds. Complete pelleted feeds are labeled such because they contain all the nutrition a horse needs to survive. And so a horse can live completely healthfully on a complete pelleted diet with no hay at all, um, other than the fact that the horse will probably be um, lacking the opportunity to, to chew because they'll be able to ingest and and sweet or pelleted diets more rapidly than hay, these diets provide everything the horse needs. And the big difference besides the fact that it's adequate in calories and protein and vitamins is that complete feeds have a lot of fiber in them, which you will not necessarily see in a concentrate. So to be called a, a complete pelleted feed, it must have greater than 16% fiber in it. And so if you're looking at a pelleted feed, it all pelleted feeds are not necessarily complete feeds unless they say that they can provide the complete nutritional requirements of a horse, including a fiber of at least 16%. Other ways to minimize the risk of colic, obviously always providing fresh water, cleaning the water buckets and tanks regularly, and making sure that they don't freeze in the winter. Alternatively, especially if you travel and you worry about your horse maybe not drinking as well when it gets water from a different source, um, just like your eye, they can taste the difference in water. Um, you can also train your horse to drink an electrolyte source as well. And there's some recent evidence to suggest um, that feeding a slightly sweet water, so, so adding sugar to your water, you can actually get your horses to drink more, that they develop a taste for that as well. So um, if you get your horse to a point where they actually like those types of water, then you can add that to water at a show or when you're traveling and the water will be more palatable to the horse. If you do that though, it is really important to make sure you still provide a fresh water source with no electrolytes or sugar so that if the horse just wants water and doesn't have a salt craving, it has something to drink. So you'll have to provide two different types of water, whether it be electrolytes or sugar and then fresh water. 
as far as parasite management, the bottom line in today's day and age is that um, with resistance factors and with heavily parasitized pastures, you really need to do more than just increase the frequency of deworming. With the, the fact that dewormers, many horses or many parasites are resistant to some of the most common dewormers like ivermectin, really the only way you can know if you're doing an effective job is to do an egg count on the feces of your horse. And this doesn't necessarily have to be on every single horse. You can collect a couple of samples from horses in, in a couple of different environments and run those a couple times a year and generally they're fairly cheap to do and actually cost less than the dewormers and will help you determine if you're actually the dewormers that you're paying for are actually doing the job you need them to do. In addition um, to fecal egg counts and alternating products pasture management is going to become probably the f one of the other tools for the our future in parasite management because with the increased resistance and deworming we're just not going to be able to use a lot of the anthelmintics as effectively and so rotating pastures and um, dragging pastures etc is going to become very important to try to minimize um, uh, parasite contamination and parasites as a cause of colic. Um, in addition, if you are um, if you if you are raising young horses, uh, foals and weanlings, it's very important that those animals be in your cleanest pastures because we know they're the most susceptible because their immune system is not geared up as well as an adult horse to to fight off the parasites that they ingest. So young stock should always go on your cleanest pastures. Um, besides all of this information, we do know there are certain um, bottom lines, and one of them is that you should always deworm for tapeworms um, once a year after the first frost, the killing frost. And the, currently, the drug of choice is a drug called praziquantel, which is currently available in several combination forms. Um, Strongid is also effective against tapeworms, although the efficacy on tapeworms is not nearly as high as praziquantel, and you have to double dose them with it to have enough to kill off, um, I think it's approximately 40 to 60 percent of tapeworms. Um, additional ways to decrease risk factors is um, dental exams and good um, uh, dental care. So uh, generally most veterinarians will say an annual exam to check for whether or not a horse needs to have its teeth floated is, is helpful. Um, that will depend again on the horse. Older horses or horses with severe problems like the picture in the bottom of the screen of this horse with a severe parrot mouth. These are animals that will need probably more frequent floating because they're going to be prone to developing severe problems and truthfully once if you can manage them when they have small hooks and small waves it's a lot easier on the horse, the veterinarian and your wallet than it is if you wait until they have severe problems and need to do fairly aggressive floating. Um, there are, just a brief mention, there are a lot of equine dentists out in the world these days and um, an equine dentist is not necessarily a veterinarian. Um, there is a difference. There are um, places that train lay people to be dentists and while um, certain, I'm sure there are a fair number of equine dentists that are not veterinary trained that can do a decent float, there are some advantages to having a veterinary dentist because not only can they do dental um, care, they also are capable of looking at the whole horse, doing a physical exam. They understand the drugs that they use and can um, are you know have understand the potential risk factors etc and um, so you will get a little bit more or I personally think a lot more out of using a veterinary dentist for your dental exams and dental care. As far as sand goes, living on a sandbar that we do the way we do, um, the bottom line with prevention of sand colic is to prevent ingestion of sand and so um, there are many products out there that are marketed to help clear sand, but the best way you can prevent sand colic is to try to prevent your horse from eating it. And that can be done by several ways. One is put, if you are feeding in a place that doesn't have any grass and it's, it's a sandy lot, is to put mats or even carpets underneath the feeders and so that if the food is pulled onto the floor, onto the ground, the horse isn't eating off the sand. And then those mats are, can be swept or shaken periodically to get any sand that might accumulate on them off. 
um, prevent horses from eating the stuff that they pull out and throw all over the ground or, or limit the amount of time they have access to a sandlot if they tend to be a horse that vacuum cleans and will hoover around the sandlot looking for any last little bit of grass. Um, not allowing your pastures to get too short so that they're less likely to rip this, the roots up and ingest sand as well. Or if worse comes to worse, feeding them indoors um, may be an alternative as well to minimize sand ingestion. As far as trying to increase the clearance of sand, there um, is limited data really that says that psyllium, or what's commonly called sand clear, is effective in removing sand. The, the jury's still out, if you will. Um, it may bind sand and may alter the motility of the GI tract such that it helps clear it, but it certainly is not the magic bullet and will not prevent the sand colic. So it can certainly be used in adjunct with these management recommendations, but shouldn't be used with the assumption that it will prevent all sand colic that you might see. Um, if you do have to use drugs like but or banamine, which are con called non-steroidals, make sure you use them as minimally as possible and make sure you watch for signs that a horse may be starting to develop problems with them. The signs that we typically look for in horses that have not are developing non-steroidal toxicity are a decrease in appetite, mild colic signs after eating, decreased interest in grain, weight loss, and um, in more severe cases you might see swelling under the chin, between the front legs, along the belly, or in the sheath or mammary tissue. Um, if you see these signs, these signs of swelling is, is a concern and you should contact your veterinarian to have them do a more thorough physical exam and potentially a little bit of blood work. Um, the problem with non-steroidals is what, what can happen is if your horse develops non-steroidal toxicity, whether it be gastric ulcers or colon ulcers, they will show signs of colic, at which point um, you may administer a, a dose of non-steroidals like banamine to control the pain, which actually continues or exacerbates the damage, and they will re-colic, and if you keep giving the drug, even though you're controlling the pain temporarily, you are exa actually worsening the disease. Probably the key to treatment of colic in terms of successful treatment is to recognize a problem early. Certainly in our world leads to a better outcome. We are much more successful in having our patients go home if their colic is recognized and treated early. Um, we may be able to correct problems by management. For example, an impaction, if it's mild, we might be able to just increase water consumption or even just pass a tube and give them water, um, force them water to try to resolve it versus if it's been going on a long time or the bowel is compromised, it may be very difficult to resolve. And with sand, early on, a sand before it gets severely impacted or severely or accumulates to a significant degree, you may be able to just manage the horse by making management changes and allowing it time to clear the sand that has already accumulated. So early recognition will really help you in terms of dealing with colic when it comes your way. As far as the initial colic treatment that your veterinarian will probably do, um, it will depend to some degree on the what he or she finds when they examine your horse. The good news is that really the vast majority and probably less than 10 percent of horses that colic actually require referral or colic surgery. As a resident, I was shocked when we did ambulatory practice how many of the colics that I saw out in the field really resolved with just maybe one or two treatments versus my experience in the hospital was that you know, 50% of colics or more needed surgery. So the truth is most of the horses that you and I own out in the field will have mild episodes of colic that never really require, never really are at a risk for having surgery. Um, so the general treatment for a colic when a, your veterinarian comes out to look at the horse is first of all to do a good physical exam, see, assess the horse for pain, for gum color and hydration, for bowel sounds, um, and also look at the manure production, water intake, etc. A rectal exam is, is probably one of the most commonly performed diagnostic tests to look again, to palpate to see if you can feel an impaction or evidence of a twist, etc. Passing a stomach tube, or what we will call a nasogastric tube, is helpful from two reasons. One, since horses can't vomit like people, if their stomach gets distended with fluid, they, will, they can get very very painful and so decompressing the stomach will help them a lot in terms of pain control and being able to manage them. 
um, on the other side, if a horse does not have a lot of distension of its stomach, you can use the stomach um, to treat colic. So if you think you have an impaction, giving oral fluids by stomach tube fluids and salt will help to soften that impaction and control it or to resolve it. Medications, um, most veterinarians will usually administer medications to try to control pain, to give the horse a little bit of time to hopefully resolve a mild impaction, etc. And pain medications that we use vary, but in general I would say the more common ones we use are non-steroidals, again, um, alpha-2 agonists, which xylazine, or most people might know it as rompin, um, ditomidine, and then torbogesic, with the additional addition, um, drug of buscopan, which is a um, antispasmodic. And then um, oral fluids, generally, if in a, um, most colics that you find basically mild signs and no clear evidence of uh, severe disease. Um, when you pass a tube, giving some fluids with electrolytes and possibly some oil um, is, is often a, um, a diagnostic and therapeutic type of procedure. The, like I said before, most colics that your veterinarian will come out to see really are going to are going to respond with just one or two treatments. Um, it is unusual for a horse to to continue to colic after being seen once or twice and and being treated as I've just described. Um, however, there are times where um, your horse does not respond, um, and you're stuck with um, needing to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to try to keep having your veterinarian treated at home, or whether or not it's time to refer to a surgical facility. And this is something that I would strongly recommend everyone to consider before they're ever faced with the problem because it's much harder to make that decision when you're under stress and anxious about your horse's well-being. So having a clear plan on what you would and wouldn't do if you have, if if one or the other of your horse's colic um, prior to that ever occurring will take away a lot of the stress in, in that decision making when you're faced with it. So knowing what your plan would be um, helps because if the animal does not respond and the veterinarian feels that it would be indicated to refer it, it's nice to know, okay, with this horse we, we do want to do that and hook up the trailer and off you go. If in the situation that that's not an option, for whatever reason, the horse has um, got other problems, it's um, a disease that's unlikely to be fixed even with surgery, um, sometimes a simp the kindest thing you can do is to not let your horse suffer and make that decision again. Um, but it will help you a lot if that decision is made prior to um, having to be faced with it because it's quite difficult to do when you're distressed and in a um, situation with a painful animal. If you do come to a referral hospital like the MSU, um, what exactly are we going to do? Well, um, we are going to repeat some of the things your veterinarian did in part because we want to feel it for ourselves so we can assess pro progress, etc. And two, because sometimes things change with trailer rides. There are, we do um, term the therapeutic trailer ride where sometimes just a ride to the clinic will help, will fix a horse, which is, an, is a, a wonderful outcome. Um, so a rectal exam is one of the first tests we will do at a hospital. We will pass a stomach tube, again, because of the risk of fluid accumulation and the fact that they can't vomit, we need to decompress them because if their stomach gets very distended, it can be life-threatening. They can either uh, rarely but occasionally um, rupture their stomach or to sometimes spontaneously reflux even though they can't vomit fluid will actually come up their esophagus and potentially they can aspirate it and get have problems with pneumonia so it's really important to pass a tube and make sure that's not going on and if if not potentially give oral fluids like we talked about before Abdominal ultrasound um, is probably the one tool that in the last 10 to 15 years has become a huge part of our repertoire. I, I sometimes feel like the ultrasound is my uh, right hand and um, is a very useful diagnostic tool. Um, the picture on the right hand of the screen is actually a picture of several loops of very distended small intestine. You shouldn't be able to see these tight balloon type structures in the abdomen and the fact that you are seeing them can be a very strong indicator that the horse has um, a twist or a strangulation of its small intestine. So abdominal ultrasound is commonly done unless we are very comfortable with a diagnosis before we actually reach for the ultrasound. An abdominal tap or a belly tap, some people will refer to it, is when we um, 
prepare a little sterile field on the ventral part of the horse's belly and put a little local anesthesia and take a sample of fluid that bathes the intestines and the abdomen. So this is fluid that kind of keeps everything moist. And we evaluate that fluid for its color, its protein, and its cell count. And those can be indicators of compromise to the intestine. The um, picture on the left is several different samples of fluid and you can see normal being the first sample on the left to getting progressively more abnormal darker color and even looking a little bit um, bloody or hemorrhagic and um, just assessing color and protein can give us a good indicator of whether or not the intestines of the horse are potentially being compromised helping us to determine whether or not the horse um, we should recommend that the horse have a surgical exploration or colic surgery or to continue to try to treat them medically IV fluid therapy is probably one of the most common things we will do with horses with colic especially if we cannot give them oral fluids because they're stomach is distended and they're not absorbing oral fluids so the placement of an IV catheter and IV fluid therapy to rehydrate them is not only important for the fact that it rehydrates them but when the intestines become dehydrated they actually lose their motility and so trying to get things to start moving and maybe resolve an impaction etc is um, very important to try to uh, potentially help resolve a medical colic Abdominal x-rays um, are useful in some situations because horses abdomens are so huge and so full of hay or fiber you do not get the same kind of detail that you would in a dog or cat or a human x-ray of the stomach or the abdomen however in adult horses we do still x-ray them primarily to look for two things sand and potentially what are called enteroliths or stones in the GI tract in smaller horses like miniatures and foals x-rays are more helpful because they do enable us to look for either severe severe gas distension like the picture on the right um, which may potentially help us determine whether or not the horse the, has a, a twist or something that requires surgery. Many horses that do come to the hospital um, do not need surgery to repair them. Um, they may simply need to be rehydrated um, and that restores motility and, and resolves whatever spasmodic or impacted problem they have. Mild impactions of feet or sand, many of those horses we can manage with stomach tube, oral fluids, and um, pain meds and fluid therapy. And um, this is a picture of a horse who's actually got a nasogastric or a stomach tube in and a muzzle so that he can't pull it out and is receiving both oral fluids and IV fluids in an effort to try to resolve a um, impaction. Horses that come in with stomach or colon ulcers, those are considered medical diseases. They will not be cured with surgery. And so trying to manage them um, with drugs that help heal gastric ulcers or colon ulcers and prevention of further exacerbation um, is the tenant of therapy. And then the gas or spasmodic colic, which is really a diagnosis that's made after the fact. So a horse comes in with no obvious reason for um, often a very violent colic and the horse gets better either on the trailer ride in or after rehydration um, this, depending on the other findings uh, sometimes it's just the diagnosis is that they've had some gas distension and that their intestines has, have spasmed and they've been painful as a result of that If your horse does come to a referral hospital like Michigan State University, um, the average cost for a medical colic, it really does vary depending on how long the horse is in and how severe the colic is. But probably kind of a general range is usually about $1,200 and or upwards. Sometimes they can be several thousand if the horse just doesn't resolve the disease quickly or it requires long-term IV fluids or intensive care. But probably 1,200 to 2,500 is a good range. Um, generally they're in the hospital a little less than a week. They may receive intravenous or oral and oral fluids, pain control, and then the key, once they've resolved their colic, um, the keys that we require before we will send them home is to make sure that they're back on normal feed and normal water intake and, and passing normal manure. So before we will send a horse home that has had a medical colic, we want to be sure that they've completely resolved it and they're as close to normal as they can possibly be in a hospital setting. 
when do we, how do we decide if your horse needs surgery? Um, there are many factors that come into this, and so I'll touch on a few, but probably the number one reason that we will determine a horse needs pain, needs colic surgery is pain. Pain that is either not responsive to pain meds or persistent pain. In those situations, um, it is often due to the fact that that whatever is going on in their abdomen is a surgical lesion because those do tend to be persistent and very painful diseases. Other strong indicators that your horse may need surgery, again, unrelenting or violent pain, severe distension of the intestines, the horse may appear bloated and we, when we rectal them, there's so much distension you can't even get your arm in. Ultrasound findings like I showed you earlier of distended loops of small intestine, um, uh, reflux when a stomach tube is passed, um, and again, pain that even if it's not severe is persisting for several days. So despite medical therapy, every time you try to feed the horse, they get painful again. These are just some pictures of horses going into surgery. Um, when they're anesthetized, they're picked up by um, a hoist by their legs and placed on a surgery table, which is then wheeled into surgery. Um, this horse has been anesthetized and laid down. Once it's in surgery, it's kept under anesthesia by a gas machine, which is shown on the picture on the, the right-hand side. Surgical lesions vary. This is an example of a horse that had a twist or what's uh, commonly, commonly called a twist or a large colon volvulus where the large intestine basically twists itself around and cuts off its own blood supply. And you can see that this picture, the intestine is fairly severely damaged. It's got, um, it's black and green at spots and um, probably needs to be removed, that section of it. Um, this is an example of what's called a fecal lith, which is essentially feels like a stone, but it's just a very firm, um, uh, compressed um, uh, mass of ingesta and is fairly common in miniatures, again, because of their abnormal um, eating behaviors and in foals. And so this um, little guy came in and had a fecal lith obstructing his distal intestine. And um, we could not, as you can imagine, this would be very difficult to soften with electrolytes or to lubricate with oil. And ultimately, this little guy needed surgery to remove that. Enterolis, I mentioned earlier that we can see on radiographs, these are two examples of them. They're actually um, formed by minerals. They actually form stones and can be um, fairly large. I've seen one that's been the size of about a, uh, a volleyball in a horse. These are much more common in Western horses, California and Texas predominantly, but we do occasionally see horses that present with enterolis or what a lot of people will refer to as stones in the GI tract. These obviously, when they're this big, cannot be managed medically. When they're small, occasionally horses will actually pass them in their manure and so they can pass them before they become a severe problem. Occasionally, and it's not um, ideal, but occasionally we um, horses with severe sand impactions will have to go to have surgical correction because they cannot break down the sand themselves and the sand can settle out and actually almost appear to be as hard as concrete and so they require surgery where we actually go in and break down that impaction and empty it out of the intestines and then sew up the intestines and put them back. In addition, horses that are um, at risk for surgical colics or sand colics or horses that are fat because of the risk of strangulating lipomas and horses that tend to eat everything in their environment because of the risk of sand ingestion. This is a picture of a horse with actually a similar lesion, a twist of its small intestine. You can tell this is much smaller loops. They look like giant sausages, if you will. And again, the blood supply was compromised because of a strangulating lipoma, which was the fatty tumor I mentioned that can hang like a tether ball and wrap around the intestine. This horse had to have this intestine removed and the healthy parts reattached and then it was recovered uneventfully. This is a picture of a strangulating lipoma. Again, the dark loop is the intestine and this large mass is the fatty tumor and the and the tether ball or, or um, uh, stalk that it hangs off of actually twisted itself around the intestine cutting off its blood supply and it subsequently had to be removed as surgery. 
surgical costs um, in today's uh, day and age, um, if a horse comes in for colic surgery, it does depend a little bit on what type of surgery it has, um, but kind of the estimates we give are anywhere from 3000 to $7,500 for the entire surgery and post-op recovery. Um, with with uh, surgical small intestinal diseases generally having a greater expense, in part because the horses often have take longer to get back onto food and get off of fluids and antibiotics. With large intestinal problems, they tend to have a generally have a more rapid recovery. Um, on average, horses that have colic surgery will be in the hospital about a week, give or take a few days. And again, this is in part to make sure that everything is going well and that the horse is eating and drinking and passing manure normally and hasn't had any complications prior to going home. Complications that we worry about in the immediate post-operative period, we worry about anesthesia and recovery because we have a thousand pound animal that is asleep and now is going to wake up laying on a mat and we have to ha hopefully get them up safely without injury. Um, when you ha when horses have colic and uh, distension of their intestine, they're more prone to having ileus, which is the medical term for poor motility of their intestine. And this is actually worsened by many of the things we have to do. Um, anesthesia increases that risk. Um, handling the intestine also increases that risk. So postoperative ileus is a common complication, though usually not a long-term complication. These horses are often very sick because their intestines are so badly damaged. They've absorbed a lot of intestinal toxins that can make them sick. Um, they have catheters in their veins, and again, with being so sick, they um, can have problems with, with catheter infections, incisional infections, laminitis, hernia, abdominal incisional hernias, and uh, sometimes they can develop scar tissue in uh, in the abdomen that can result in colic down the road. Hmm. Sounds like a lot of people lost sound. I hope there wasn't anything critical. As far as if your horse does have colic surgery, um, what's the long-term prognosis? So uh, what's the chance your horse will come back to being a normal, healthy horse? Well, with in large intestine, um, um, colic surgeries, it's it's very good, again, with, with exceptions, but in general, um, if you look at the literature and certainly at our success rate, probably 90% of horses will go home. Um, so, you know, certainly a fairly good prognosis. With small intestine, it's a little bit lower than that, and it, there are certain things that will increase or decrease that percentage, but I would, but generally the average is 70 to 80% of horses will, will go home um, in the short term and do well um, as well. Because um, a true diagnosis isn't always made before we go to surgery, unfortunately it's difficult to give people a really accurate um, prognosis until we get in there. And then certainly the next few days, how, if the horse ha develops any complications, is really the key to determining if the horse is going to have an excellent prognosis or not. Ways to minimize your stress when you're about whether or not your horse is going to have colic. Um, there is equine insurance that's available that um, will provide either medical insurance, uh, medical slash surgical insurance, where if you um, get a policy, they will pay um, a certain amount of the cost. Um, usually, you settle, you set the fees, as well as mortality insurance, which just provides that if the horse doesn't survive, they will. Um, reimburse you for the cost of your horse. Um, in general, the cost of insurance is cheaper than the cost of um, going to a referral hospital, um, certainly for a year, um, and uh, does definitely minimize your stress about the possibility of it occurring. So other ways is to set aside a fund that you have so that if something does happen, you have a source of income. If you do go out of town and leave your animals with other people, make a plan. Have a plan, have numbers available, and have it thought out as to exactly what you would and wouldn't do should your horse have colic and require colic surgery. And um, that's the uh, end of my lecture. I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I see there's been a lot of questions and um, answers by Dr. Garcia. Um, if people have additional questions, um, I will certainly be online for um, a bit longer. So ask away. 
somebody just asked a question about how much um, colic insurance costs. I would say, um, in general, medical insurance for colic or for medical surgical insurance is usually about four to seven hundred dollars a year. Um, it, it, most companies require if you're going to have medical slash surgical insurance, you also have mortality, and that's where the additional costs usually come in. Um, there is a question about the use of banamine um, on the farm and um, banamine is a very a fairly potent pain relief reliever and um, there are situations where a horse is very painful and to decrease the risk of the horse injuring itself or the personnel I think banamine can be used judiciously but with any other drug as with any other drug it does have potential side effects and so um, using it once is certainly in certain situations a good idea but repetitive use can get into trouble I guess would be my comment who there's a lot of questions um, Let's see. Okay, someone asked, what is a long-term prognosis of small and large bowel colic requiring surgery? Um, well, the short, you're right, we're talking about short-term. Um, with large colon, the long-term prognosis is, is fairly close. I would say probably, again, 80% or so. With small intestine, the long-term really depends on the, on the, um, the study you uh, look at, but with small intestine, um, you can have anywhere from long-term survival out a year or more being about 80 percent to some report a little bit less than that, maybe 65 to 75 percent. Uh, there's a question on whether or not uh, rolling can make a colic worse. There's there's really not any research. Um, you know, most people, the reason that your veterinarian or most people will say don't let your horse roll is the risk that the horse will hurt itself further. Um, and because you could argue that with certain types of colic, displacements, etc., moving may actually help re restore the appropriate positioning of the intestine. But generally, rolling is considered a bad idea because the horse can hurt itself. So most of the time we will recommend that if your horse is trying to violently roll, you should probably get it up and walk it and try to stop it from rolling. There's a lot of questions coming in here. So um, as far as Metamucil or Cilium for the treatment of sand, um, I would say that the use of those drugs has not been definitively shown to be um, 100% effective, but it also has not been shown. There are some studies that show that it may have some benefit in helping to clear sand. And so I think it's a good idea if you know your horse is ingesting sand to try a product like that. But I also think that the, the best way to prevent sand colic is to try to limit the ingestion of sand. Um, somebody else asked a similar question on the preventative medicines, which I'm assuming when you're talking about preventative medicines for sand colic, you're talking about sand clear type of products or psyllium. And again, there um, is data that says uh, conflicting data. There's a little bit of data that suggests that it may actually increase clearance of sand, but it's certainly not the magic bullet. And really to prevent it, you need to control the ingestion. Um, as f a question has come up, is a horse that has had colic surgery in the past at greater risk for having another colic episode than average? With certain diseases, yes, there is an increased risk. So with a co um, what's called a large colon displacement, those horses have a higher risk for having a large colon displacement down the road as well. Um, there's a question about does beet pulp cause colic? And um, beet pulp fed appropriately has not been associated with an increased risk of colic. 
Uh, when a horse has colic surgery, the recovery time for colic surgery is a very good question. Um, generally, the rule of thumb is a colic it, after colic surgery, you have about 90 days before you have your old horse back. The first 30 days are spent in a stall, completely stall rested. The horse can be hand walked um, as much as you'd like, but it cannot be, do any kind of trotting or other exercise. After 30 days, it, the next the next 30 days or up to, out to 60, the horse can have a little more activity can have a small paddock if you like but again no no uh, major exercise and then after 60 days that horse can gradually be returned to work the um, things that might affect that timing is whether or not the horse has had complications associated with the surgery which might change that 90 day period uh, does exercise help reduce the chance of colic? In in studies that have looked at risk factors for colic, horses that are outside, um, that are not stabled, that have access to um, pasture feeding or, or are fed longer periods of time, etc., have a decreased risk. So certainly it would seem to imply that being able to move around improves decreases the risk of colic but as far as does exercising your horse so taking it out and jumping it every day those types of things has not really been shown uh, there's a question about whether or not horses um, colic with with a change of season is this rare or I guess common would be the flip side and um, like I said earlier we seem to have every year there does seem to be an increased incidence of colic associated with changes in temperature I would say although in a study looking at risk factors that was not actually shown to prove out to be a risk factor specifically but it does seem that when horses when there's a very cold snap or a very hot increase in temperature that we do see an increased incidence of colic but it doesn't appear to be specifically associated with the temperature so it must be something else that's occurring at the same time Well, if there's not any more questions, which I don't see any more, um, then I think we're done, Amanda. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Um, sure. I just wanted to um, give a brief conclusion and talk about some upcoming webcasts that we have. Um, but first, we want to thank Dr. Carr for her presentation this evening and also um, Dr. Garcia for answering all of your questions and especially want to thank all of you for participating. Uh, you will soon receive an invitation to participate in an email survey and it would really help us if you would give us your feedback. And I want to talk about some upcoming webcasts. We're going to continue the Horse Health Series in February with uh, a free webcast on respiratory disease. And future webcast topics are also going to include lameness and equine emergency first aid. And we also want to let you know that My Horse University is now on Facebook. So become our fan to have access to exclusive deals and get the most up-to-date information on our events, courses, and more. And also want to remind you that this webcast was recorded and will be uploaded to our website later this week. Feel free to send us your comments and suggestions to info at myhorseuniversity.com. And just want to say thanks again and hope you all have a great evening.